Hello and welcome to Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind. And today we're talking about one of the most commonly encountered cancers, certainly an important one for any budding oncologist to uh, to know about. And, and to my mind, probably only behind breast, prostate, and maybe lung cancer in terms of the, the, imagina- the imagination and the minds of the general population. I'm talking, of course, about colorectal cancer, for those of you who uh, didn't read the episode title, uh, which, as we'll hear very soon, afflicts thousands of people a year. But uh, do you know, Josh Hurwitz, uh, who colorectal cancer rarely affected? No, please enlighten me, Mikey. It is uh, dinosaurs. Uh, and uh, and I, <laughs> I, I will have you know that there is actual uh, documented evidence of this. And there is a paper uh, that we'll link in the episode description for any budding paleopathologists uh, listening. And paleopathology just seems like the, the coolest uh, uh, career in, in, in the history of ever. Um, but people have actually completed epidemiological studies of tumours in dinosaurs using fluoroscopy. And they screened the vertebrae of about 10,000 specimens and found metastatic cancer in only 0.2% of samples. And okay. somehow somehow they've linked that to a, a family of duck-billed herbivores which may have feasted on foliage-rich in carcinogenic tannins, phenols, and resins. But so I, I might interrupt you, Mikey. I have multiple questions to this. Um, have they looked at the DNA? Do they understand the resistance mechanisms and why these uh, amazing dinosaurs did not get cancer? Ah, uh, well, you see, this is a this is a limitation that is stated in the study. It's very difficult to uh, extract DNA from fossilized uh, samples of dinosaurs, no matter what Jurassic Park tells us. Okay, so they've obviously done um, step one. What's step two in them to explore further the barriers to identifying and obtaining proper genetic sequencing? <laughs> well, well, I don't know, because normally uh, when you get these sorts of studies, the conclusion is uh, future prospective trials are done, uh, are required to have further insight into this, uh, this phenomenon. But Josh, I think it would be very difficult to do a prospective study on dinosaurs. And the Sadly. and the ethics for that would just be horrendous. They probably don't even speak your language. Absolutely, I don't know how you can sign get them to sign a consent form. But <laughs> Josh, we're we're on a podcast for for inquisitive onks, not inquisitive paleontological oncologists, and we aren't here, unfortunately, to talk about dinosaurs. No matter how many childhood fantasies that would fulfil, we're actually here to talk about metastatic colon cancer affecting our far more bipedal and far less ancient patients. That's a good intro. Mikey, as uh, we always like to say, welcome to Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind, only... (laughs) Welcome to Jurassic Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind. Uh, To let everyone know, Michael wanted to do the introduction this week. I uh, let him. I did, and you. I've I've said before, and I'll say it again, you really shouldn't let me have free reign on these things because I'll go full Richard Attenborough. Amazing. Let's get into it so people actually learn something today. So uh, I'm going to be talking on the background of metastatic colorectal cancer. I would say, Josh, just before you go, I would protest that they have learned something. They've learned that if you're a dinosaur, you're not likely to get cancer at all. You're just more likely to die from a meteorite impact. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So 20 years ago, let's take take a step back when it comes to metastatic colorectal cancer. 20 years ago, so I'm talking about the early 2000s here. Fluorouracil was the sole active drug in slowing the process of metastatic colorectal cancer. So think of it. That's grim. Yeah, so That's very grim. One drug that might have potentially helped. And when we looked at that, the overall survival at that point in time with their three, phase three trials was 10 to 12 months. That's equivalent to really lung cancer or any other terrible metastatic cancer. And this is not that long ago. Thankfully, there's been significant progress and development, which is, you know, the optimistic side of our oncology for the inquisitive mind. And the current average median survival duration is approaching, Mikey, how long? Ah, 30 30 months? Three years. He was close. I'll give it to him. With a five-year survival rate as high as 20% in some trials treated with chemotherapy alone. So not, not bad in the metastatic setting. 
No, not at all. Let's talk a bit about the background. So I'm not going to go into all the nitty-gritty today, but I will go into some of the nitty-gritty. As always, demographic and, and epidemiological information is key to signifying colorectal cancer's importance. It is the third most common cancer in the world by incidence and the second highest with respect to mortality. There was a meta-analysis from 2018 that estimated over 800,000 deaths from colorectal cancer globally. And the incidence of this cancer is expected to rise to greater than 3 million in 2040. That's a lot. That is that is a substantial proportion from one disease. Exactly. And Mikey, I just wanted you to like react. So thank you for that. With metastatic disease reported in at least half of all colorectal cancers with liver mets being the predominant in about 70 percent of all cases 20 percent of cases diagnosed in the united states of america today have metastatic spread initially so one in five when diagnosed with colorectal cancer will probably not be curable which i mean is obviously terrible for those one in five patients but it really also speaks to the quality of of screening and awareness that 80% by those numbers, Josh, are catching this sort of uh, disease, which is frequently obviously very insidious because it's cancer, uh, in the curable stage. Exactly. And let's talk a little bit about the clinical presentation now that you talked about the insidiousness. Uh, A lot of people, if they're asymptomatic, but things that you look out for, change in bowel habit, rectal bleeding, rectal masses, iron deficiency, anemia, abdominal pain, turns out is a very uncommon symptom. Only about 3.8% of patients will have that. But when you're looking in a metastatic setting, think of weight loss, lethargy, uh, you know, synthetic liver dysfunction, obstructive jaundice, where you turn yellow for no reason. That's probably a late stage, but it's still like, a, oh my gosh, what's happening? So what do you do at this stage? You know, you've got a cancer of some sort, you need to diagnose it, right? This is, you need to diagnose it and stage it because then you're going to have the options of what you can actually do with the patient. We need a biopsy. Every cancer needs a biopsy, despite what certain specialties might say. You always need a biopsy. Um, the most accurate way of doing this, especially, I guess, in the metastatic option, you're going to say what is the most common or what is the most uh, easily biopsiable site. But if you're going for a colonoscopy, that's actually the most diagnostic and versatile di- um, diagnosis of colorectal cancer. When you're looking at colonoscopies, what you can see is the sensitivity with an optimal colonoscopy is 94.7%. Only 5.3% were missed. So that's a pretty good hit with an optimal colonoscopy. But how frequently do you have, maybe we'll reach out to some gastroenterologists and ask them how frequently they actually have an optimal colonoscopy. That's true. Um, Other options can include pill cams, although again, that's for you might not be able to biopsy with those, but you can definitely see things. Good for small intestinal intestinal cancers. The other thing we've got to talk about is tumor markers. A lot of my patients are like Josh, why don't we just have a blood test? And I, and I go to them, if I had a blood test, I wouldn't be doing this. Yeah, it's a very very common question from our patients: is why wasn't this particularly when you're talking about metastatic cancer? Why wasn't this caught early? And the most common question leading on from that is why don't we have a blood test? Exactly. But to give you a little bit of an example, um, CEA or um, what does CEA stand for, Michael? Uh, Cardioembryonic antigen. Antigen. Very good. Very good. Uh, just just involving you. Now, thanks, Josh. The, the specificity of CEA was 89%, so not too bad. But the sensitivity is about 46%. So not ideal when it comes to a test. Um, so specificity of going back to the med school days if you spin you in so from a diagnostic test you definitely want a high specificity but you also want a sensitivity because then you can rule out the cancer so while you might be able to rule in you can't rule out if they... and, and given that um, cea is frequently used as a screen so you know patients will have some vague symptoms and the primary doctor will say well you know I don't have an endoscopist or an endoscopy handy, so let's do something that's simple and minimally invasive and do a CEA. So it's frequently used as a sort of almost a population screening tool, which makes sensitivity very, very important. And if it's very poorly sensitive, you're going to miss a lot of cancers, which we frequently see in oncology. That's it. And 
moving on from that, you've got your biopsy. That's great. When you've got metastatic cancer, you want to stage them. So you want a CT, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Sometimes you'll do an MRI contrast enhancing or um, to look at the liver, especially if they're potentially resectable. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then you've got the PET scans. Mikey, do you use PET scans much in your colorectal cancer staging? That's a good question. And leaving aside the usual considerations of availability and cost to the patient, I would have to say that PET scans are potentially frequently less commonly used with uh, colorectal cancers. Uh, I guess the information that you're going to get is probably just as easily obtained with a CT scan um, and a colonoscopy. So that's a very long, very long winded way of saying, saying, and, and really I'm just, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're hearing me realize this live on, not on camera, but on recording. National television. National television. Exactly. It's the realization that um, actually no, compared to a lot of other um, cancer types, I don't use PET scans as frequently, even if I have them available. Amazing. Yeah. So positron emission to, to tomography is not used that common when it comes to colorectal staging. It can be used in certain settings. These would include if you want to localize sites of disease recurrence, where the rising CEA is incongruent with that of a CT scan. And you're like, I think there's disease. I don't know what's going on. And when just the conventional imaging doesn't help you. The second is also evaluating patients who are thought to be present for future candidates for a section of isolated colorectal cancer liver meds. Histopathology. Uh, it is a predictive my So why, why do we want histopathology? Essentially, it's a predictive... We were looking for predictive biomarkers, expression that's driving therapeutic decision-making. To put that in layman's terms, we're looking for things that will make our treatment work better because our current treatment is just chemotherapy. And not that we'll get into it too much, but there are a couple of subtleties with the type of histopathology. Most, as you're probably just about to say, Josh, most colorectals are adenocarcinomas, but you occasionally get weird things like mucinous carcinomas and poorly differentiated carcinomas. Not that it changes our approach much, but sometimes it does change uh, what we expect from treatment. Yeah, I mean, you can also get neuroendocrine tumors as well and carcinoid tumors and other such things that are just completely different. So I'm not going to go into the appendix as well. Yeah, I'm not going to go into that, everyone. So we're just going to focus on the adenocarcinoma population because it can get a little complex and then it gets confusing. But the three predictive biomarkers I will briefly mention today are the RAS wild type or the RAS biomarker, which is part of the RAS, RAF, MAP, K activating mutation. And you're like, what is that, Josh? I'm so confused. Imagine every cancer has an on switch and an off switch. And these on switch consist of multiple points. That's what this is. So the RAS, RAF, MAP, K pathway is literally three points where when they're activated, they cause cancer to progress faster the mechanisms that are used to kind of cure these cancer cells don't work anymore and they develop into metastatic disease. How's that, Mikey, for a basic kind of like 101? I love it. I love it. And I think I'm going to use that uh, with uh, with patients. Imagine, imagine, if you will, that every cancer has an on switch and an off switch. That's great. Don't t- I'm not going to admit how, how long that took me to actually understand it. I remember learning this in first year of med school when you looked at the pathways being like, oh, I just have zero understanding. So but in putting it in context, it's actually quite relatively easy to, I guess, um, identify and even just understand that concept. Anyway, so the benefit of this particular epidermal growth factor receptor is that we then have potential treatments like cetuximab and panitumumab. I won't go into it in any more detail just yet. The incidence of these being mutated is can be as high as 45%. But remember, we're talking about wild type. So wild type means these pathways ain't be, ain't be mutated just yet. The second one to talk about is DMMR or MSI high. So microsatellite instability that's high or deficiency in the mismatch repair mechanism. So this in a summary is DNA gets damaged. It ain't being repaired. That therefore means that we potentially have a treatment option. Which, which, uh, not to uh, cast too long a foreshadowing shadow, but which will be elaborated on a bit later. 
Yeah, that's it. And the prevalence, which is the one thing I'll, I'll give from you from your study, Mikey, is about three point five to six point five percent of stage four colorectal cancers. The third option, which we won't talk about in this particular talk, is the HER two mutation. Now, HER two, you might have remember um, us talking about this in breast cancer and other. You, sorts. you did a bit in gastric cancer, Josh. Yeah, and essentially it's present in colorectal as well, about 3 to 5%. And if you've ever heard of the DESTINY trials, they're doing DESTINY colorectal. So they're essentially trying everything that's in breast and then throwing it at colorectal to see what happens. And there are some emerging data that's quite, uh, quite exciting. Okay, let's go to treatment before we talk about our trials. Initial treatment, you have to ask yourself, is this potentially curable or is this widespread? When I say potentially curable, I'm talking about oligometastatic disease when you have several extra lesions predominantly in the liver only. There's some talk about other things like massive surgeries like omentectomies and removal of the the peritoneal layer of the abdomen. I'm not going to get into that because that's also quite a controversial area. But we first have to see is, uh, is this resectable if, if this is not? And then it goes down to what are the mutations and what can we actually do? So if this is RAS wild type, you have the option of Folfox, Folfox Siri, or Folfox Bevacizumab. You're like, Josh, what do these mean? Folfox is a combination of drugs. So fluorouracil, oxaliplatin, leucoborin. Have I missed any? Folinic acid, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the chemotherapy proportions of the um, fluorouracil and oxaliplatin and the rest is just to counteract the anti-metabolite um, uh, function. It's like uh, why you give, uh, what is it, B12 on the days where you don't take methotrexate? Exactly. Um, methotrexate, for those that don't know, gets rid of your B12. So you want B12. Or and is folate, it folate? Right? I think it's, it's actually folate. folate. Yeah. It's folate. We'll, we'll edit that. <laughs> it's an anti um, and then you've got Folfox theory, everyone. Uh, the only difference with that is you've got Arenotecan as another chemotherapy agent. And then you've got Bevacizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody. Now, in this setting, the optimal chemo is unknown. So what I mean by that is that Folfox theory versus Folfox versus Folfox Bev, there isn't data to say what's best in this setting. What they... And the thing is, people sometimes use Folfoxirian subset of the population where they're young and they're healthy and you really want to try and go for cure because they're in their 30s and or 40s and they've got a lot of life to live. Now, the other option is Bevacizumab um, in unresectable liver mets. This is interesting, Mikey. Bev, Bevacizumab only modestly improved liver resectability rates when added to Zelox or Folfox, which is 8.4 versus 6.1 months. Okay, so you might have lost uh, lost me there, but essentially what I'm saying is when you add this monoclonal antibody to the baseline chemotherapy, it will not change the outcome or your ability to resect. And I guess, Josh, just to sort of, I guess, narrow down on that, because we're not really going to talk about it too much, but we are seeing patients, and they're a small subset, but we are seeing a subset of patients that, the location and the burden of disease is such that even though they're metastatic, resection is possible. And Josh, you mentioned that 70% of patients um, have liver mets um, or or have disease that metastasizes to the liver at some point. Uh, If it's anatomically possible, so generally speaking, not near or involving the porta hepatis, then you can do partial hepatectomies. Um, we We do have patients who have uh, oligometastatic lung uh, uh, lesions in the setting of colorectal cancer, and sometimes we see these resected. But uh, you are right, Josh, is that generally if we're going to try and give perioperative or quote-unquote neoadjuvant, no one really knows what to call these sorts of chemotherapies because technically it's palliative because they're uh, metastatic, but also it's done with sort of operative, preoperative, curative intent. So sometimes we call it Neoadjuvant, I think a lot of people have settled on the less uh, inflammatory uh, uh, title of perioperative. But we are seeing patients, and you see them every now and then, who have what we call resected stage 4 cancer. And to my mind, it's really, it's really very much luck of the draw. We don't know why cancer goes where it goes. 
we don't know what factors influence it going to a certain part of the liver or a certain part of the lungs. But if you do happen to have a patient with a small amount of disease, it is important uh, before you sign off and tell them, I'm sorry, you'll never be cured. It is important to have a discussion either in an MDM or with your friendly neighbourhood hepatobiliary or thoracic surgeon and say, look, I've, this lady or this man has one or two spots in their liver. They're otherwise fit and well. I think they could tolerate a hepatectomy or a, or a VATS uh, uh, wedge or a lobe resection. Do you reckon we can get them cancer-free? Because that really, really does improve outcomes if it is achieved. Just to summarise, so if it's resect, potentially resectable, you're going to hit them hard with whatever your institution uses. Uh, usually it's three to six months with MRIs in between and a discussion with your surgeon because you want to see if they can still respond very well. Remember that. So even if they're potentially unresectable, they might respond enough that you could have a sustained duration of response so you could resect them. So that's important. And if they are unresectable, meaning they've got widespread disease, it doesn't matter what you cut out, they're just going to have cancer, think of the mutations and think what you can do. So if it's MSI high or DMMR, you want to give immunotherapy. If it's HER2 overexpress, consider HER2 therapies. If it's RAS or BRAF mutant, that would be chemotherapy plus bevacizumab. And if it's RAS, BRAF wild type, meaning no mutation, chemo plus cetuximab or panitumumab. How'd I go? Very, very good. Um, I know where, well, on, on the recording, we're about 20 minutes into the episode and we haven't even got to our trials yet. But there is there is a lot of very established data on colorectal cancer and it's sort of gotten to the point where we just sort of accept it and move on. So there's not much point us going through the studies from the early 2000s on Folfox and Folfiri when there's so much more exciting stuff to talk about. And Josh, why don't you take us away with FIRE3, which looked uh, looked at answering this question about what biologic do we add to chemo? Because every patient with metastatic incurable colorectal cancer, unless there's a reason not to be, should be on some form of biologic. That is right. Mikey, I've got a fire in my belly and I'm ready for it. Or did you just eat a really bad burrito? I did not. I made curry. Well, that too um, is... That, <laughs> that, that, that is that is also a cause of the fire in the belly. Anyway, please. Okay, so the Fire 3, which is from 2014, everyone, published in The Lancet, if you are looking for it. It's, uh, it looks... So the background of this study was... Uh, cetuximab and bevacizumab were known to improve the outcomes in patients with metastatic colorectal cancer when added to chemotherapy regimens. But what was not known was in the context of combination with three chemo drugs. So remember I spoke about Folfiri or Folfoxiri, um, whatever you want to say it, but essentially that's fluorouracil arenatecan and folinic acid. So Folfiri in this particular case, and that was unknown. So at that point in time, they wanted to know, does this monoclonal antibody work with this chemotherapy regimen? They aim to compare three agents and patients with KRAS, so exon 2 mutations, or sorry, exon 2 wild type metastatic colorectal cancer. The method? <laughs> I'll make it short, considering we're up to 26 minutes. The method was an open label phase three, meaning no one was blinded. So you had to be stage four, colorectal cancer, a good performance status. You couldn't be expected to die within three months. And those patients are only the ones that have obstructive jaundice or are in hospital and essentially bed bound and you don't think they're going to make it. And there, this, this trial was conducted in Germany and Austria. Uh, they were randomized to Folfiri plus Cetax versus Folfiri plus Bevacizumab. The endpoints, primary endpoint was proportion of patients with an objective response, complete or partial response, put that in brackets, so how many people had a reduction in the size of their cancer. And the secondary endpoints was progression-free survival, overall survival, and depth of remission. When looking at the demographics. I don't like to harbor on this because it's not the it's not the really important parts, but what is good to know is when you're looking at the patients, about 20% had previously had 
adjuvant chemotherapy, meaning they'd obviously relapsed. About 80% previously had had surgery of some sort, which means, does that mean a lot of them had relapsed as well? I, I don't know. That's an interesting question. And most patients or two thirds of patients had at least two sites of metastatic disease. Average age in their 60s predominantly, men definite predominance about 70%. Objective response, what they saw as Fulfieri plus Satax was, so this is an interesting study and I'll get to the reasons why, was 62% and Fulfieri plus Bevacizumab was 58%, right? Complete response was in 4% versus 1%. And partial response was 58% versus 57%. What are you getting from this so far, Marky, with these stats? That they're pretty much equivalent. That is correct. And I'm like, what? But Josh, they're the same. What's what's going on? Wait for it and, and you'll find out. There are some subtleties to this, which Josh will uh, speak about. I know. I'm dropping the Easter egg just in time for Christmas. Um <laughs> You, you really don't know your holidays. Anyway, please continue. <laughs> Progression, <laughs> progressive disease, 7% in the Fulfieri plus Satux and 5% in the Fulfieri and Bev. I'm not going to talk about the rest of them because realistically what you're seeing is the response rates are pretty much the same. Let's go down into the RAS wild type. Maybe we'll see something better there. Objective response, again, pretty similar, 65 versus 60%. Complete response, 5 versus 1%. So I guess the complete response is better there. Partial response is 60 versus 58%. Again, what I'm highlighting here is even in this particular cohort of patients, it's pretty much the same. And then you go to the RAS mutant population and you found the, the bevacizumab arm works better than the cetuximab arm. And Michael, going back to when we spoke about the optimal treatments, why is it that BEV works better than Cetux in the RAS mutant subgroup? Well, uh, this is something that I always say to people going through their exams is that the RAS, so Cetuximab is an EGFR um, inhibitor, an EGFR receptor inhibitor, uh, which lies at a more upstream uh, point on the pathway that includes RAS. So if the RAS is mutated and it's firing off autonomously, you can block the EGFR uh, until the cows come home, but the RAS is still going to be fired. Whereas if it's wild type, you block the EGFR and the whole pathway actually stops. Um, I know you're not going to get into this, Josh, but there have been studies testing EGFR um, uh, as a marker of response for colorectal cancer, um, and it doesn't really affect things. So if you've got a RAS mutation, the EGFR uh, blocker is not going to actually work. It's like blocking blocking a river upstream when there's, I don't know, a, a pipe or something running into, the, running into the river and supplying it independently of the stream. That's a good analogy. I like that one. Thanks, Mikey. You so can me- have that free of charge. Free of charge. Uh, medium progression-free survival, 10 months in the Satux arm and 10.3 months in the BEV. So guys, no difference. And but then you're like, what about now? What about the overall survival? And this is when it gets interesting, right? So you found an overall survival benefit in the Satux, which is 25 months, uh, sorry, 28.7 months in the Satux arm and 25 months in the Bevacizumab arm with a hazard ratio of 0.77 with a p-value of 0.07. So there was no progression-free survival, but there was an overall survival benefit, right? Did you say the p-value was 0.07? So 0.017. Ah, right. So still meeting the um, statistical significance cutoff. Exactly. And so they've done a post hoc analysis. I'm not going to go into, just because of time, I'm not going to go into toxicities, but acne form rash is probably the really big one um, that you see with the cetuximab and the panitumumab. Also, you can see patients have liver toxicities, fatigue, diarrhea, nausea um, and with panitumumab more than Cetux you can have allergic reactions on infusion so that's just something to remember when talking about this post hoc analysis they found the median overall survivals is better in the Fulfieri plus Cetux group versus the um, uh, versus the Bevacizumab group so 33 months versus 25 months remember this is a couple of years later right 
Um, and the other things they found is the patients that had an objective response was 72% versus 56%. So again, better overall response, you know, more tumor shrinkage they saw as well. And, and when they took a method median depth of response or how much it shrunk, it was better in the cetuximab arm. And then you've got the Firefox plus Cetux or Bevacizumab with the final update from 2020. I went through the them all. Fin- <laughs> so, so about three or four updates because this, this is a, a fairly long running study, isn't it, Josh? It is, it is, well, at least six years. I think this was the final one when they said final in their title, but who knows, maybe it'll be like Indiana Jones or come back for another sequel. Anyway, so the median, median overall survival in the RAS wild type was 31, sorry, 31 months in the cetuximab arm and 26 months in the bevacizumab arm. And so I think it actually raises a couple of good points with this trial, Mikey. And I think that's something that we do need to really highlight is that we always use progression-free survival as a surrogate marker. This study proves that that's not always a good idea. Very much agree. I mean, we, we, we frequently see um, the opposite, actually, with this trial, where there might be a PFS benefit and then no overall survival benefit. So it is interesting that we're getting the, the overall survival benefit without a PFS benefit with this uh, study. That's exactly it. And so going back to the question, which is probably what everyone's like, oh my gosh, Josh, I don't even remember, is I actually wanted to see did Fulfiri work, right? That was that was the primary question. So Fulfiri does work and Satux works, but it's in, you know, it, it works better in certain subgroups of the population. And I think that's something really, really to highlight. So Satux does not work that well in the RAS mutant. It works better in the RAS wild type. Okay, so if you've got a RAS mutant or KRAS mutant or any of that pathway we spoke about at the top, do not use Cetux, not use Panitumumab. Would you agree, Mikey? I would, absolutely. And I don't even think, at least in Australia, you can get access to Cetuximab if it's RAS wild type. I I think that's one of the uh, PBS criteria. It is, but you can always pay for it. That is true, but uh, you shouldn't, is what we're saying. All right, Mikey, I've been yabbering for so long um, about my trial. Please enlighten us on what is actually a bit more of an exciting trial. It's talking about immunotherapy. We love to bring up immunotherapy. It's the, you know, the drug that just keeps on being wonderful. Every patient wants it. Not everyone should have it. Absolutely. Um I think that FIRE 3 is is one of those really essential building block trials because, uh, as as Josh mentioned, uh, deficient uh, mismatch repair uh, protein, uh, patients with a deficiency in the mismatch repair proteins um, in colorectal cancer only accounts for about 15% of patients. So you are looking at 85% of patients where you're going to have to make the decision, I'm going to give them a, a chemotherapy, and we, as you said, uh, Folfox, Folfiri, Folfirinox, they're all, I mean, Folfox and Folfiri are relatively similar. Folfoxiri is actually better, but more toxic anyway. Um, so you're going to have to make that decision and you're going to have to make a decision about what you use, Bevacizumab versus Cetuximab as an adjunct. But we are, we have a very distinct population of patients where you don't even need to think about that. And that's patients with uh, what Josh mentioned briefly before, a uh, deficiency in their mismatch repair uh, axis. Now, a little bit of biology, biological backstory, some might say. Um, the uh, mismatch repair proteins, con- uh, mismatch repair genes, I should say, consists of four genes. Um, MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2. And if you're anything like me, the second you read them, the second you hear them, they've gone from your memory. But don't worry, because they're usually included in any pathological report for metastatic colorectal cancer. Uh, These can be sporadic. They can also be hereditary. And and Josh, I didn't actually know this, but sporadic cases, uh, which account for about 80% of the 15% of patients with DMMR, um, are usually manifest as a methylation of the MLH1 gene promoter. Now, I don't know if you can actually use this to imply or, or sort of 
uh, retroactively assess whether it's uh, sporadic or not. Obviously, you need a family history and everything for that, but that's the most common sporadic mutation. Uh, but 70% of hereditary cases, and we're talking most commonly something like Lynch syndrome, which is associated with DMMR, colorectal cancer, are associated with germline mutations in MLH1 and MSH2. So potentially if you have uh, uh, abnormal expression of multiple genes, you are more likely to have a hereditary uh, underlying cause. A deficiency in MMR results in the inability of cells to recognize and repair spontaneous mutations. It's exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, deficiency in the, uh, in the cell's ability to repair uh, genetic mismatches. This results in a high tumor mutational burden, which was once the big, you know, next great thing. We can just sort of look at a cancer's t- uh, TMB and just without knowing anything else about the cancer, we can use that as a marker of uh, response to immunotherapy. It's a little bit more nuanced than that, and unfortunately, despite what they have in the States, which is a sort of tumour agnostic approval for immunotherapy with a high tumour mutational burden, the evidence is that that's not really the only thing that goes into response. Uh, But that's not the case here, because PD-1 blockade has previous evidence of a very, very good effect in patients with uh, DMMR colorectal cancer, who before this study... Keynote 117, uh, the only evidence we had was with people who are refractory to chemotherapy. And so naturally, uh, some bright spark said, well, if it's good in patients who don't respond to chemotherapy, then why don't we just cut out the middleman and give it to patients up front and compare it with chemotherapy, which is what Keynote 117 is. So it's a multi-center phase three trial, much like FIRE 3, it was unblinded. And that's really a practical thing because the immunotherapy, pembrolizumab in this case, uh, was given every three weeks, whereas all of the chemotherapy regimens, uh, which is Folfox or Folfiri with either Bevacizumab or Cetuximab, so the, the four combinations of those uh, two chemos and two biologics, is given every two weeks. So it's just naturally impossible to blind because you can just look at the frequency and you, you can see what you're getting. They recruited a shade over 300 patients, and eligible patients were greater than 18 years uh, years old with metastatic colorectal cancer, confirmed uh, centrally to be deficient in the uh, MMR genes. Uh, they had to be ECOG 0 to 1 and have adequate organ function. Um, and usual uh, the usual uh, exclusion criteria, such as having uh, uh, pre-existing autoimmune conditions that are standard for any immunotherapy trial apply here. Uh, Previous adjuvant chemotherapy was allowed if it was greater than six months prior to randomization. So as we always say with those sorts of things, you're taking out the patients that are really, really aggressive. Um, You don't see them often, but if you if a, if you have a patient who's had a resection, adjuvant chemo, and they've recurred within six months, it's a very bad sign. It's also for the drug sponsor, Mikey, that when people have, unfortunately, when people have rapidly aggressive cancers, standard therapy is unlikely to work, and you're never going to get these trials over the line if that's your cohort of patients. You're just going to not show the benefit you need to show. Absolutely, and we know that that can, if you, if you have enough of those that can skew uh, trial results. But also, practically speaking, getting a patient on trial is a lot of work and it does take a lot of time. And you've got someone who's already refractory and probably rapidly progressing. Then by the time they get on the trial, they might not meet some of those other criteria, such as adequate organ function. So 100%. It is, it is unfortunate, but sometimes these are, sort, these are the sorts of people who the best thing for them actually is not to get on the trial. Um, so there were patients were randomly assigned one to one to receive Pembro or the investigator's choice of chemo. Treatment was continued for a maximum of thirty five treatments, uh, which uh, accounts roughly for two years, which is the standard duration of immunotherapy. The primary endpoints were progression free survival and overall survival, and the secondary endpoints were response rate, duration of response, and safety. Uh, Much like Josh, I don't like to harp on about the demographics, but I will mention that there was a very good spread of uh, patients with various mutation statuses, which statuses, status I, I'm not sure what the plural of status is, looking at BRAF, KRAS, and also NRAS, which is a a rarer subtype of a a RAS mutation um, that to my mind, or to my knowledge, doesn't really impact on 
uh, treatment modalities to this point just yet. Uh, so approximately a quarter of patients were wild type across the board. Uh, approximately a quarter of patients had a KRAS or NRAS mutation. Approximately a quarter had a BRAF mutation. But a significant proportion, again, the last quarter, were not available for mutations. So there's not, and, and remember, we're only dealing with a trial with about 300 patients in total. So it's difficult for us to look at how mutation status impacts someone's ability to respond to immunotherapy. The other thing I will say with uh, uh, the demographics is that approximately two-thirds of patients uh, had at their primary tumour on the right side, which is very, very typical. But you're still having a third of patients who are DMMR uh, who have a left-sided tumour, which emphasises the importance of of looking at DMMR status across all uh, newly diagnosed cancers, regardless of their location. So the, in terms of the results, the median duration of treatment exposure, and I think this sort of gives the game away slightly right from the start, was 11.1 months in the Pembro group versus 5.7 months in the chemo group. I think your study was just a little bit nicer than mine. It just seems a little easier to kind of explain. <laughs> We always, well, yeah, I mean, the FIRE 3 study, and uh, if if Josh's very, uh, very excellent explanation did was a little bit confusing, we will, as always, link the uh, studies in the description. Um, but, you know, it's very difficult to express in words these multi-arm studies and have it come out okay the other end. Uh, so, yes, I definitely did get the easier and probably the better study uh, this week. The... Progression-free survival, which was the primary uh, endpoint that they looked at first, uh, you're looking at a doubling of progression-free survival, 16 versus 8 months with a hazard ratio of 0.6. The 12-month PFS uh, was 55% versus 48.3%, so over half of the patients receiving immunotherapy did not progress at at, uh, at uh, the one-year mark. Josh, what do you think... Um, Throw out some numbers of what you think the 24-month PFS was uh, in the IO and chemo uh, groups. 33%. In which one? Uh, so the chemo group alone would be, I'd say, 20%. I'd say the IO group would be 33 to 40%. Well done. Remarkably close. So the 24-month uh, tw- uh, PFS in the IO group was 38.3 months. Or 38.3%, I should say, sorry, um, versus uh, 18.6% in the chemo group. But you can see in the space of that 12 months, you can see a real significant drop-off in patients receiving chemotherapy that is not quite uh, the same in the immunotherapy. And this is where that flattening of the curve comes in. Uh, in terms of the response rate, that was greater in the Pembro group as well, 43 versus 33%. And 11% of patients in the Pembro group had a complete response. Remember, this is for metastatic cancer. And it is something that we're seeing a lot, and there was a lot of excitement in the rectal, so not colorectal, but the rectal space, uh, again, for DMMR patients, of neoadjuvant immunotherapy causing complete responses in the early setting. So we are seeing patients get a really good response to immunotherapy. Um, In terms of overall survival, now this is where it gets interesting, Josh. Given everything that I've said before, and this is a bit of a leading question, but do you think pembrolizumab had a statistically significant overall response benefit when compared with chemotherapy? Are we we talking about objective response? Or overall survival. Overall survival, sorry. <laughs> That's fine. I was like, oh, I want to say yes. No, mate. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to cover yeah. all my bases. Co- cover all your bases. So the answer, if we're looking at the the word of law, is no. What was so, the follow-up time? So the, um, follow-up, the median uh, duration of follow-up was about 44 months. So, again, we are looking at, you know, you said the the median overall survival was about three years for existing sort of treatments. Um, so we're already looking at more at, uh, greater than that. Um, the p-value was not significant. I think it was like something, something like 0.2. But if you actually look at the numbers, it's very interesting because the median overall survival in the IO group was not reached after 44 months. 
and it was 36.7 months in the chemo group. Now, I don't know enough about statistics to know why it wasn't statistically significant. But at the same time, it's very difficult when you're looking at the raw numbers to say that they're... And, and if you're looking at the Kaplan Meier curves and what have you, um, it's very difficult to say that the, um, that the immunotherapy is not better. We can confidently say it's no worse than chemotherapy, um, but we can't definitively say it's better. But at the same time, it's sort of better. You know, we're just sort of going to say that. But what we can say is that it would delay your time to having a go on chemotherapy. So either even if you can't convince someone and being like, oh, you know, chemotherapy, it's like you will get minimal side effects probably and we can delay you starting treatment for 12, maybe 24 months and that gives you an extra 24 months of time of time. You hit the nail on the head, Josh. Uh, you hit both both nails, <laughs> both nails on the head, actually, because that that <laughs> you bring up two very good points: is that this is not necessarily replacing or rendering a another line of treatment uh, obsolete. It's not. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. It's not uh, TDXD to TDM1 in her two positive breast cancer. Um, you can still have chemotherapy, but you know chemotherapy has certain connotations all of which are or most of which are very very deserved but a lot of people are not keen for chemotherapy when there is an alternative but you can still get the benefit from chemotherapy which is uh, in the control group still fairly fairly uh, fairly decent you also mentioned toxicity and that is another uh, very important point so if you look at the grade 3 toxicity rates for pembrolizumab versus dealer's choice chemo um, the rate of grade three toxicity for Pembro was 22%. Um, and the rate of in er, the rate in the chemotherapy group was 66%. So it is a treatment that is definitely no worse. It's probably better with about a third, the rate of grade three toxicity, which means, and we are already seeing this because this is starting to become a much more widely used treatment in Australia and certainly abroad as well. Um, we are seeing that patients who we would not dream about giving any sort of systemic therapy, uh, you know, very old, uh, elderly people or um, people with multiple comorbidities that, you know, you're really worried about them having, um, having chemotherapy. Immunotherapy, therefore, is an option and a very effective option for patients with DMMR colorectal cancer. I've actually got a, a patient uh, on the wards where I work right now who's 95 and um, has a new diagnosis of DMMR colorectal cancer. And um, we're still sort of sorting out the ins and outs of her functional status. But if she is a good 95, um, she would be someone that you could give immunotherapy to you really would struggle to find someone who would be willing to give chemotherapy to someone of that age. Yeah, you're flipping a coin if you're going to give chemotherapy to a 90-year-old. I would, I don't care how healthy they are when you see them. They're healthy until you give them chemotherapy, and that's the thing that ends up killing them. It's all about the reserve. Um, you know, they're fine when, when nothing is wrong, but when you're stressing them, that's, uh, that's a different option. Or lack of reserve. Or lack thereof, exactly. So, in summary, of uh, to summarise Keynote 177, it is now a standard of care in the first line in uh, DMMR, metastatic colorectal cancer. In Australia, it's now approved on the PBS, which is very exciting. Um, coming back to that RAS-RAF, you know, mutation <laughs> status question, um, the, the, there is a small data set, but in the discussion of the study... There appeared to be no progression-free survival pen benefit in patients with a RAS mutation. Now, again, it's a small number, but it's a it's hypothesis generating, as they say. Um, <laughs> the, the authors postulate that adding a CGLA four or chemotherapy to pembrolizumab or immunotherapy could overcome this resistance. And there are actually studies, specifically Commit, which is looking at chemo plus atezolizumab and Checkmate 8HW, and Josh, I think we can definitively say that they're just picking random sorts of random uh, collections of letters and numbers now rather than just sequentially going up on these Checkmate trials. They run out of them, not up to number 15,648. Yeah, it to... gets to a point where it's just getting a bit ridiculous. Um, but that one's looking at Ipinevo in DMMR colorectal cancer. But these are ongoing and they probably won't read out for many years. Um 
the lack of statistically significant OS benefit is interesting, and it's probably a subtle point, you know, saying if, if we're going to go by the letter of the study, we can't say whether it'll improve your benefit, but it's not worse. And it probably wouldn't change your management anyway. It's also very important to say that in Australia, if you don't use immunotherapy first line, you're never using it because it's only approved for first line in colorectal cancer. So you really need to use it first line or not at all. And we talked about the better side effect profile and toxicity. Now, Josh, very, very briefly, if you will indulge me for a few more minutes, because we've talked a lot about KRAS in this, uh, in this episode, but we haven't really talked about BRAF. So if you will allow me, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about BRAF. Oh, Michael, just before you do, I'm just going to quickly summarize my talk again. Just got to so get, people... got to get your five cents in. Um, when we look at Cetuximab plus full theory, just remember the two things you need to remember from this study. If it's KRAS wild type, you're going to see an overall survival benefit, not necessarily progression free survival benefit, but there's also improvements in objective response rate, shrinkage of tumor size. And you, of course, have to look out for those toxicities such as acneform rash and diarrhea and reactions, although less likely, and fatigue. But, Mikey, that's all I wanted to say just so I could summarize my my talk in three sentences or less. Go ahead. Love it. It's really difficult to uh, summarize a, a, a trial like FIRE3 uh, in three sentences or less. Um Four sentences, it's okay, but three sentences... That's oh, hard. three sentences is the cutoff. Like, it's impossible. Um, the reason we should talk about BRAF uh, and no no um, uh, podcast episode, even on a uh, show as illustrious as ours, um, would be complete without talking about BRAF because BRAF mutations, even though they're, again, only present in less than 20% of patients with colorectal cancer, they are a very significant prognostic factor. And until recently, that was all they were. If you have a BRAF mutant colorectal cancer, you tend to uh, have a more aggressive subtype of disease and then you tend to have lower response rates to standard therapies. So there is nothing good about having a BRAF mutant uh, colorectal cancer. There still is nothing good about having a, a BRAF mutant colorectal cancer, but at very least we can do something about it, courtesy of the Beacon trial. Now, the Beacon trial is a second or third line study, so patients had already progressed through at least one or be- between one and two um, lines of chemotherapy um, and com- uh, examined patients' r- uh, responses to using the EGFR inhibitor cetuximab, which we've talked about, and combining it with basically the BRAF treatments that were nicked from the melanoma space. So uh, encorafenib, which is the uh, BRAF inhibitor itself. And as we've talked about um, in uh, one, of our, one of our very early episodes, Josh, we're going back a little bit, um, but you combine a BRAF inhibitor with a MEK inhibitor because if you do a BRAF alone, at least in melanoma, you get fairly rapid resistance. Correct. And so... The, and so they combined encorafenib with its with its uh, hanger on binimetinib plus cetuximab. So you had a doublet of encorafenib plus cetuximab, a triplet encobini plus cetux, or chemotherapy. So those were the three arms. And only if only the dinosaurs had known about this, they might still be alive. Well, I think it just shows a complete lack of dinosaur pharmacists and dinosaur <laughs> drug developers. That's where they went wrong. It wasn't the asteroid. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Keep going. Love that you brought that back. Um, so, again, looking at the primary endpoints for this, it was overall survival. They were initially looking at the triplet, and we've looked at studies with similar study designs to this before. Uh, the uh, Checkmate studies looking at gastric cancer in uh, come to mind, and obviously, if you haven't listened to that episode on gastric cancer. Right after you finish this episode, make sure you go and listen to that one because it is just as meandering, I promise. So they were looking primarily at the triplet, but they also had a secondary endpoint that was looking at the doublet. But unlike those checkmate studies where there was no real facility to compare the doublet immunotherapy and the chemo plus single agent immunotherapies, Beacon actually went the next step and was able to compare the doublet and the triplet arms. 
So in summary, the encorafenib containing arms were better than chemotherapy across the board. Um, the uh, overall survival in both the doublet and the triplet arms was 9.3 months compared to 5.9 months, and the PFS was 4.5 uh, in the triplet, 4.3 months in the doublet, and 1.5 months in the chemotherapy. And, and Josh, what do those numbers tell you? They're very similar, Michael. They yes, are incredibly true. similar. Yeah, so... And so I'm going to pose you the question. You've got a doublet and you've got a triplet and they're very similar. Why would you on, why on earth would you ever use the triplet chemo? Or the triplet well, the, the answer, Josh, to that very, very pointed question is that you wouldn't. Um, and because we actually have firm data on this, um, we don't use the triplet at all. So comparing the doublet to the triplet, the hazard ratio of overall survival was 0.95. And any uh, hazard ratio that close to one, you can be sure that the confidence confidence interval crosses one. So we don't know actually whether it's better or worse. Um, if you look at the subgroups, again, those those forest graphs, the, the lines all hang around the line of equivalence and they all cross it, which means, again, we don't know whether the doublet or the triplet is better in real life. We just have a sense that it's around the same. And obviously you're adding, you're comparing three drugs with two drugs. The expectation is that three drugs are going to be more toxic. And that's exactly how it uh, turned out. Although the rates were only slightly high um, when you're looking at grade three toxicity, 65.8% versus 57.4. But again, if you are a patient who has a grade three toxicity, that percentage does not matter because it's happened to you. So, Doublets, the doublet combination of cetuximab plus encorafenib is a treatment option and it is approved in Australia for, I think it's second line and beyond. Second line, um, yeah, that's correct. Second line and beyond. It still hasn't been compared to first line treatment and I honestly doubt it would be better. But as a, as a follow-up to chemotherapy, um, or I guess immunotherapy, um, if you happen to have BRAF mutations and a DMMR, um, it is definitely an option. And I guess the theme, Josh, of our three trials is that we are very much adding to the arsenal of uh, of treatments for colorectal cancer. That is correct. And also goes back to my introduction where I said, you need the histo because that gives you the options for your patient. Absolutely. And this is this is a prime example of why histo is becoming more and more important yep and in 10 years time when michael and i are gray and old and we're talking about oncology again the the updates like remember that time when immunotherapy remember was that new time and where we needed well, to have a tissue diagnosis pepperidge farm remembers exactly pepperidge farm will probably <laughs> own um our dna but no this this uh, the summary is immunotherapy is wonderful option in msi high and dmmr patients Cetuximab is a and plus four theory is a really good option in the KRAS wild type population. And if you've got someone who's got a BRAF mutant, V600E is the one specifically that they've used. Make sure you look at the doublet treatment, right? The Enco Cetuximab. And I think the summary is that where we've come from 20 years to where we are now. We have gotten somewhere with colorectal cancer, but given the number of deaths and how many people are affected, we have a long way to go. But we at least have three treatment options that we've mentioned today, plus a fourth that we haven't, which is the HER2. So that on top of chemotherapy definitely gives patients hopefully a better quality of life and more time just around. That is a fantastic summary, Josh. And really, I think that it makes the uh, last uh, hour of us yammering at each other uh, into a microphone completely irrelevant. Um, but if you have, in- but if you have enjoyed the last hour of our yammering, then make sure to um, f- uh, follow us on all of the social medias. I don't even pretend to know which ones we're on these days, um, and consider subscribing on your local um, podcast channel because we really enjoy doing this we enjoy uh doing it every week and there'll be episodes every week as long as we can speak into a microphone so for many many years and uh, stay tuned for our next episode coming out 
to a podcasting service near you in seven days. Are we gonna are we gonna talk about what's next, Josh? <laughs> Michael, I don't remember on our list, so no. why don't we just cut it? Let's let, we'll... let's, let's just our, our list is already gone to theoretical anyway. <laughs> So see you next week. So we'll see you next week, and um, uh, I don't, I don't have a sign off. I always It'll have be a sign off. Fantastic! I yeah. know oh, you're, you're speechless for once. I am speechless at the uh, the development of colorectal cancer treatments. Anyway, we will see you guys in a week. Goodbye.